Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another video. Hope you're all doing well. And uh, today I'm going to be doing a little vinyl finds video for you. First one for quite some time. <clears throat> so um, let's get into it. Firstly, just a bit of VCLT. Um, so this is one record sent to me actually by this person, but he sent me quite a few others. And I'm just going to show one today because um, it's one of the ones I've been spinning a lot this week. So this is from George Scott Spinner One. Great guy up in Scotland, um, big hi-fi nut, jazz fan. Check him out if you haven't already. <clears throat> George uh, was extremely kind. He sent me a copy of this record and I was totally uh, knocked back to, to get it. Knocked back, knocked out to get it. My Life in the Bush of Ghosts by Brian Eno and David Byrne, which came out in 1981. And um, this is a record that I've never seen in the wild, uh, really hard to get hold of it I think. Um, I last heard this album in October of 1991. Uh, I'm not going to go into why I can date that so exactly but um, that's the last time I heard it. Never bought it on CD or anything, just so pleased to get this. I mean the history of this record is really interesting, I could do a whole video on it you know. Brian Eno and David Byrne obviously had worked together already on the Talking Heads album, um, more songs about buildings and food, which is this, uh, the second album that um, Eno worked on with Talking Heads. And um, Eno and Byrne had got on well together and then they went on to make this record prior to doing Fear of Music, I think. And um, it's amazing how kind of early this is. If you'd asked me when this album came out, I would have said maybe 1988? really didn't know it had come out as early as that and then when they started working on it in 1979 um it was a very um innovative album made use of a lot of samples you know they sampled all kinds of weird and wacky wonderful things on here you know american radio hosts there's a lebanese mountain singer on here algerian muslims chanting the quran and you've got american preachers and just all kinds of weird things but um the music which runs through the album it's got that kind of uh, early talking heads early brian eno talking heads sound that kind of funky african drive kind of sound really really great stuff you know really fantastic brilliant um forward thinking music and um yeah like i said i've never seen a copy of this so george thanks ever so much really grateful for that and um, george sent me a few other things too which uh I need to show in a future video. Quick shout out as well actually to John Downing, Six Inch Pianist 319 and John Bellamy uh, who've also sent me some things which I have yet to show uh, but I will get to them uh, soon guys, okay. So thanks very much indeed. Okay moving on now to the vinyl finds. So all these records I bought from VOD Music in Mould in North Wales. Now I think I'm right in saying it's the smallest record shop in the UK. It is truly tiny. There's barely room for two or three people uh, in the shop at any one time. I went there and there was a guy already in there and it was a real, it was a trick, you know, trying to negotiate, kind of working your way around because there's one person in there. So the shop is run by a great guy called Colin Truman uh, from um, Mould in North Wales. And I think he used to be a market trader and then he saw the lease on this little tiny shop, like a key cusses shop size, you know. And he's filled it with records. So the second-hand records are on the floor in cardboard boxes and you have to sort of pull them out and stoop down to kind of go through them. And then there's a rack of new stuff kind of on one side and a rack of new stuff on the other. So, I mean, it really is really tiny. I mainly shop in there for second-hand records. In fact, I've not been in there for about three or four years. I felt quite guilty because um, just for one reason or another, I just hadn't been down there. But I thought I'd pay a call. And um, hopefully Colin has forgiven me because I did um, walk out of there with quite a few records. So um, I'll show you what I got. The first one actually is a new record. And um, when I saw it in the racks, I just couldn't resist it because it's such a soul classic. And it is What Colour Is Love by Terry Callier. And um, this is a record which I've known for many years. I bought it on CD probably about 10 years ago now from Oxfam here in Lancaster. It was a blind buy. Obviously, when you see a cover like that on a CD or a record, you've just got to check it out, haven't you? Didn't know anything about him at the time. Took it home, listened to it, was totally knocked out by it. Never seen a copy on vinyl. This is a music on vinyl reissue, which came out. Not quite sure when it came out. Some verb. That's the label for you. And um, 
yeah, so when I saw this, I thought, right, I'm just going to have to get it. And it, I mean, it sounds magnificent. Um, just a bit of brief history on Terry Callier. He was he was from Chicago originally. He um, he signed to Chess originally, but then he ended up on Cadet Records, which was a subsidiary of Chess. And he recorded, I think, three albums in the early 70s. This was one of them. The others, I've got some notes here. Help me to jog my memory. Occasional Rain in 1972. This album, um, also in 72, What Colour Is Love? And then I Just Can't Help Myself in 1973. All three records were produced by Charles Stepney, who was a very well-respected R&B guy. You know, he'd done uh, Ramsey Lewis and Earth, Wind & Fire, I think. And um, But these records were not successful. They were not hits at all. And um, Terry ended up leaving the music world. He went off and trained to be a computer programmer and then ended up taking a job at the University of Chicago. And then in later years he was discovered, I'm not quite sure what the story is, he was discovered by the British hip-hop scene and he ended up working with all kinds of people, Beth Orton, Paul Weller and Massive Attack and he finally started to receive some attention and then he was he was fired from his from his job at the University of Chicago when they discovered who he was because he was just this guy you know an employee working with them nobody knew who he was and when his music career was kick-started he you know he got fired but anyway, I don't suppose he minded that shame though because he died shortly after it's always this story you know the guy that misses out on all the fame and fortune and then he finally comes good and then dies of cancer anyway so to cut a long story short this album um it's kind of a lost soul classic but there's, there's more to it than just soul music there's jazz in there big sort of jazz arrangements huge array of instruments you've got you know big string sections cellos harps harmonicas you've got brass flutes alto sax percussion bit of a kind of wall of sound going on really his voice runs through it he's got this very um deep resonant voice a uh, huge amount of dignity to the way he sings. Socio-political kind of themes coming out in his work. Think Curtis Mayfield, think Marvin Gaye. It's definitely that kind of thing, you know. Um, but it's very ornate. It's very Baroque, actually. Um, shades of folk music as well and blues. It's, it's a real mixture of stuff, but uh, an absolutely classic album and one that I was uh, delighted to pick up on, on vinyl. Music on vinyl. 2015, actually, it says there. So... Um, yeah, just superb. What Colour Is Love by Terry Callier. Rest in peace. Right, okay, so I'll just whiz through the second-hand stuff. None of these records are particularly rare or anything, but uh, they were just ones I wanted for the collection. This one is an 80s reissue of, I'm assuming, a 50s debut album. I think it was his debut album. Um, it's not an uncommon record, but uh, this one was in lovely shape, so I grabbed it from... Uh, Collins' second-hand box. This is Bo Diddley, and um, it's the, the original Chess Masters series. Um, you've got the original liner notes from the original album back there. And you've got all these hits on here, you know, Bo Diddley, I'm a Man, um, Diddy Wad Diddy, Who Do You Love? Um, so, yeah, Ellis McDaniel, born December the 30th, 1928, in Mississippi, and... There's the great guy. Unfortunately, not pictured with his famous uh, big square guitar, but uh, nevertheless, a pretty cool image of him. And uh, on the chess label there. So yeah, thought I'd grab that. That was, I don't know, it was less than a fiver, I think, and it's in beautiful condition. Like I said, it's a reissue, but it comes back from the 80s, so you know somebody looked after it. So uh, yeah, a bit of Bo Diddley, can't go wrong. And then this one, um, this is an artist who I've never really um, collected or listened to in any big way, but I did pick up a record by him a while ago and really enjoyed it. He's one of these artists that I consider to be a bit of a slippery slope. But um, I had been getting into a bit of jazz fusion and rock fusion, and I'd, I'd enjoyed the previous album that I'd got, and that was um, a George Martin production. And this one is too. This is Jeff Beck and Wired, which came out in, goodness knows when, 1976. And this is the one that features his version of the Charles Mingus song, um, Goodbye Port Pie Hat. Great version. Absolutely wonderful. Um, his guitar playing is, is really on fire on this record. Jeff Beck is an interesting musician because he, he's clearly got this huge harmonic range and you know he can play in any style. 
So, he, you know, he does jazz, he does r and B. I I mean, there are some moments on this record which almost sound like kind of Sly and the Family Stone, kind of really hard funk. But then he'll go into something quite jazzy or, I don't know, you know, quite... Um, quite bluesy sometimes as well but he never gets far away from that uh, to me anyway it always sounds like he never gets that far away from the kid in the guitar shop you know playing through a an amp for the first time he's got that kind of punky edge to his sound I mean he was always a fan of people like Chris Gallup and you know James Burton and all those sort of you know rockabilly guys and it, it really comes through in his playing it's sort of a primitive quality so he's kind of sophisticated but he's also primitive it's a really beguiling mixture. Great band on this record. You've got um, Michael Walden on drums, just incredible drummer. Jan Hammer on synth uh, from Weather Report. And um, who else we've got? Max Middleton, um, who's a British keyboard player known for his Fender Rhodes playing, but also on this record he plays clavinet as well. Got really kind of funky Stevie Wonder style, you know, clavinet playing on it. So yeah, great pickup just on Blue Epic, and uh, that was quite cheap as well, so uh, I grabbed that. Again, a George Martin production. I don't quite know why uh, or how he and Jeff Beck came to team up in the 70s, but obviously they did. So that was a good one. <clears throat> now this next one, I was really surprised to see this, because um, I've never seen a copy of it before, and uh, yeah, really chuffed to find it. This is the Lilac Time. Now, um, I th I've got a feeling that John Bellamy showed this record a while ago, but I think he was showing a reissue of it. I could be mistaken, but um, this is their debut album. This is the version that came out on Fontana. Um, originally it came out on Swordfish, as in the Birmingham record shop Swordfish, because the band approached them to finance it. So it came out on Swordfish originally, and then it was brought out a couple of years later on um, Phonogram Fontana. So this is the Fontana issue. It came out in 88. I think the original came out maybe the year before. So the Lilac Time are um, Stephen Tintin Duffy, uh, late of the original version of Duran Duran. He actually left the band while they were still at school, I think, so he never kind of tasted any of their uh, success. He went on to, <clears throat> I think he signed to Virgin Records and he made a few records that were unsuccessful. And then um, this was meant to be, I think this was meant to be one of his solo albums, but he lost his deal and um, with Virgin and then like I said he managed to get some finance uh, from Swordfish in Birmingham to make this record and the, the Lilac Time it was himself and uh, his brother I think and a friend great music I picked up their second album last year which I loved and um, it's very English very winsome I guess you'd, it's kind of like chamber pop mixed with folk and but it's got a a good range of instruments, you know, really nice musical um, settings, you know, some strings creeping into the picture. It's very kind of earthy and um, plugged into some kind of tradition. It's hard to describe it actually, but it's kind of shot through with that English sense of melancholy. The standout track is probably Return to Yesterday, which um, sums up their sound really, that kind of um, pastel shaded, nostalgic kind of sound. Great, uh, he's a great wordsmith, just just a really brilliant songwriter. Um, even though their career never really sparked, you know, commercially, he did get a really um, faithful fan following over the years, and he's come good in recent times. You know, he's worked with Robbie Williams, and you know, he's become a kind of songwriter for hire now. And he's, he's, you know, I think he's kind of cleaned up in more recent years. But um, yeah, really chuffed to get that Be beautiful condition. I mean, it's been well looked after. Um, plays like a dream, as they say. So, um, yeah, cool. The Lilac Time debut album uh, on Fontana from 1988. Okay, two more. Um, this next one, a band whose records I never see around, and I kind of, I do, I do like what they do. I don't like everything that they've done, but this is probably my favourite album by them. Um, it's Susie and the Banshees and A Kiss in the Dream House, which is probably their fourth album, fourth or fifth album. It's the one that came after Juju. So, um, obviously they started out as a very raw and primitive sounding post-rock, post-punk band. But by this point, what year was this? This was 80 something or other, I'm not quite sure when. Um, yeah, not quite sure when. They'd started to get a bit more production in their sound. Um, 
you know, layered vocals, and they'd started to bring in some more instruments. You've got kind of recorders on this record and strings as well, actually. There's a kind of chamber pop sound coming in, a bit of psychedelia thrown in, a bit of 60s kind of stuff. Really interesting record. Great track list. You've got Cascade, which starts the record, and then you've got Green Fingers. She's a Carnival is a fantastic song. Um, on side two, my favourite track is probably Melt. But, um, yeah... There they are, including uh, the redoubtable uh, Steve Severin, of course, on bass, bass organ and six string bass, and um, Budgie on drums. There is not a band whose records I see around. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen one of their records around, so uh, just re really nice to get hold of it. There's the custom label there. Um, so, yeah, on Polydor. Let's just get, just get the date for you, because I, I couldn't remember. 82. I, said, so, yeah, I mean, quite early, really. They had a whole sort of second half of their career, and I just don't know those records at all. I've got the first four or five albums on a CD box set, but I don't know their later stuff, so I need to get uh, listening to that. So, um, yeah, cool stuff. Susie, Susie and the Banshees, and A Kiss in the Dream House. Fantastic artwork on that one. And then this last one. Um, what can I say about this? Long-term viewers of my channel might remember a story I told about Paul Heaton and why for years I could never listen to him. It was a, quite a sad story, a bit of a pathetic story. I'm not going to repeat it here, but I had a kind of grudge against him because of something he said once in an interview uh, about the Beatles, and I sort of didn't listen to him then. And I never followed his career in this band or um, with the Beautiful South later on, but uh, I bought a Beautiful South CD a while ago and really enjoyed it, and then um, I saw uh, Doug, Fat City Vinyl doing a little spotlight on these guys and talking about the House Martins. So I thought, right, when I saw this record at VOD Music in beautiful condition, I thought I'd pull the trigger on it. It was only cheap, so I picked it up and I'm really, really pleased I did. What an excellent record. Um, here you can see um, Norman Cook, of course, who went on to become Fat Boy Slim. And um, there's Paul Heaton with his songwriting partner, Stan Cullimore. And um, yeah, so this is the album that contains Happy Hour. This was their first album, actually. It came out in uh, 86 uh, on Go. And um, they had a very frothy, upbeat, happy kind of sound, which kind of... It was deceptive, really, because the lyrics had this kind of political... Um, kind of, you know, satirical, biting quality. Paul Heaton, a very left-wing guy, you know, he's a socialist. He famously bought an entire row of derelict houses in, in Hull, his native city, in order to turn them into low-rent accommodation for homeless people. You know, he's a good guy. His heart's in the right place, but, I mean, a fantastic songwriter as well. And um, I was really knocked out by this album. Like I said, so daft. When you don't listen to an artist for just for some silly reason and then you catch up with them and it's just, it's so up my street, you know. It's got that kind of witty, acerbic, English pop music quality. Vocally, he's quite like Morrissey. I'd probably describe him as a sort of post-Morrissey singer, really. He's got that kind of slight, slightly effeminate kind of wail in his voice. But a really amazing voice, actually. Very soulful. Maybe even touches of blue-eyed soul coming through. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, really pleased to get that. And um, in a future instalment, you may well find that I have another House Martins record to show. They only made two albums, two studio albums, and then I think they had a best of album. And then that was it, they were gone. So very short-lived, but um, a very worthy of, um, band in the, in the canon of British pop music. So delighted to get that into the collection, the House Martins. London Zero, Hall 4. Before I go, just a couple or three channel shout outs. Now all these three channels are people who are new to me on the vinyl community. That's not to say they've not been around for a while, just that I've only recently discovered them. The first one is Lloyd Boone. Now, I think Lloyd is down under. Great guy, check him out. Um, great taste in music. He's into the Beatles, Neil Young, Bowie. He likes a lot of British stuff he's been doing. He did a, a Supergrass albums ranking video a while ago which is very entertaining. I've just seen now, he just uploaded a Rod Stewart albums ranking. So that's my Saturday night sorted out. So yeah, check out Lloyd Boone. But then we've got PC31, Vinyl Policeman, um, which is uh, Mike in Portsmouth. I discovered him through Richard McCook's channel. Mike's got a great channel. He shows some great things. He's got a very nice delivery, very kind of calm and smooth and nice to listen to. Great taste in music so, and a good channel name as well. And um, so yeah, that's... Um, that's Mike. And the final one is uh, a, a young guy who I discovered via 
uh, Tommy Burton's channel. That's Tommy Tommy's Musical Adventures, and he's called Sam St John. Um, young guy from I'm guessing from his accent, he's from one of the southern states in the US. Um, but again, great taste in music, you know, Beatles, Tom Petty, Van Morrison, all, all the good stuff. And uh, seems like a good guy. His channel is is growing, so uh, do check him out if you get a chance. Right, that's enough rambling from me. I shall take my leave. We'll try and come back soonish to do another video. I've got at least another 20 or 30 records to show, so I'll need to kind of spread them out. But I hope you enjoyed that update. So take care, I'll see you soon, and uh, bye for now.